Hey, we're live, apparently, according to my internet. So, uh, welcome along, everyone, to this uh, unusual thing. So, um, I've been meaning to do this for a while, really, and so this has given me the opportunity with the Animal Rights Show having a week off. So, uh, welcome along, uh, everyone. So, as you can tell from everything on the screen, this is to do with a concept called instrumental reason. So this is um, this is a lecture, and if it if this kind of goes well, I, I might do some more in the sense that some of my lectures used to have something to do, or at least to have some connection, in my view, with um, with veganism and, and social movements. And so um, we can do this again if if uh, people feel it's uh, it's gone quite well. This uh, started off as a um, a third year course in um, University of Bangor, University of Wales uh, in Bangor, and then a second year course in um, UCD in, in Dublin. So this this is kind of like slimmed down to, to second year level in a sense. Now there is an issue that um, as a third and a second year uh, lecture, it kind of assumed a certain amount of, of sociological knowledge which I'm assuming this audience won't necessarily have. And so I, I'm going to try and kind of fill that gap, if you like. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I will say that um, I haven't uh, delivered this lecture in something like nine, ten years. So I'm a bit rusty, not in terms of the lecture, but in terms of the nuances of the kind of debate that goes along around it, which may or may not come up in the um, chat. I also might not be able to um, to engage with the chat as much as usual, but I will get to that in the end. Now, before we go, uh, oh, go before we start, <laughs> there's me jumping ahead or what? Um, before we start, I want to introduce you to my assistant. So we've got um, uh, Dr. Yates here, and we've got um, Okay, so where is that echo coming from? It's weird. All right, let me sort that out. I've done something wrong. Mute. Yeah, just let me mute that. And let me bring that back in again. Okay. All right, I think that's done it. Okay. Let me try that again. It all went swimmingly at the re rehearsal. So uh, let me see if I can bring in the doctor and the professor again. Ah, uh, well, I'm going to get rid of that idea. Ah, uh, well, that was just a little joke about having three of me, but uh, you can forget about it because it's obviously something I can't do. So instrumental reason then. <clears throat> we... um. I used to start off this this lecture with um, something from uh, this book, um, Slaughter of the Innocent. Um, now, Slaughter of the Innocent was very um, a big book, really, in the movement in the 1980s when vivisection was the main issue in the movement, and scientific anti-vivisection was a big issue as well. So, Hans Reuss, this is the author. This is my comic. Uh, a hero, Spike Maligna, the well-known typing error, uh, doing the, um, uh, yeah, Ronnie says, one of you is enough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, that's probably why it didn't work. Uh, so M Milligan did the kind of um, endorsement at the front. So we start off with this example of instrumental reason, and this is from um, page 306. And... Um, what Royce is doing, he's, he's quoting um, Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding. And so back in the day, and still maybe, I haven't really checked this, I should have done, um, the Dowding Fund was one of the alternative research things along with the Dr. Hadwin Trust. So the chances are that they still exist, or if not, they're probably being renamed like, um, like everything gets gets done. So Hans Reusch is um, quoting Dowding. And so the, the, the fund was run by Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding and his partner, the Lady Muriel Dowding. 
Um, so this is from the House of Lords in 1957, a speech. And uh, Dowding is talking about a doctor friend of his talking about uh, medical students and their attitudes. And that's where you get this thing about what particularly struck him, the doctor, was the callous attitude of people who were otherwise normal, decent members of society. When a young man who was joining together rats was asked, and I always thought that phrase was fascinating, joining together rats, kind of what does that mean? What on earth can the use of this experiment, what is the use of this experiment to humanity? He answered, I don't know what's good it's going to do to uh, humanity, but I do know what it's going to be good for me. It's going to get my degree. So that's our first example of uh, reasoning instrumentally. And I always used to like to um, to give that as a first example because um, it, it meant that I was tuning my students in to the anterior section movement, if uh, nothing else. Dr. Adwin Truss is now the animal uh, free research in the UK. Yes. OK, good. And um, what about the Dowding Trust? Is that still going? Mm, that, that, that's an interesting one. OK, so instrumental reason then. This is explored in the Frankfurt School in three main books. So we've got Adorno and Horkheimer, a, a very famous book um, from 1972 called The Dialectic of Enlightenment. Then we've got uh, Horkheimer on his own, The Eclipse of Reason. And um, then we've got probably the most famous one of all, which is 1964, One Dimensional Man. So this is um, that. Uh, this is the second edition. And in fact, um, I will be using some material from the intro to the second edition, which was by Douglas Kellner, a kind of well-known critical theory kind of expert, if you like. So looking at the, the intro. Um, to give you a flavor, I, I always like to quote the first line. How about this for a, for a first line from a book? A comfortable, smooth, reasonable, democratic unfreedom prevails in advanced industrial civilization. Um, so if, if that line is not going to get your attention, kind of nothing will. So that's one dimensional man. Um, another resource for this would be <coughs> Stephen Bronner from 1994. That's a book called Of Critical Theory and Its Theorists. And then the guiding text for the lecture really is Ian Crabe's book from 1992, uh, published by Routledge, uh, which was called Modern Social Theory. So, that, so that's where we are in terms of, of the background to the resources used for the lecture, essentially. So we get our first flavor of um, what we talked about from Herbert Marcuse himself. Now, this is taken from the prospectus of One Dimensional Man. So that's basically his kind of blurb to the publisher to get a, a deal. And he's describing the theme of the book. He says, this book deals with certain basic tendencies in contemporary industrial society, which seem to indicate a new phase of civilization. These tendencies have engendered a mode of thought and behavior, which undermines the very foundation of the traditional culture. Now, we're going to come back to what that might mean, the, the traditional culture uh, part of it. Um, the chief characteristic of this new mode of thought and behavior is the repression of all values, aspirations, and ideas, which cannot be defined in terms of the operations and attitudes validated by the prevailing forms of rationality. And then this is, I, I, if you like, is the important part. The consequence is the weakening and even the disappearance of all genuinely radical critique, the integration of all forms, um, of all opposition in the established system. So I think there we get our first little hint that this is going to have something to do with the kind of things that vegans are interested in uh, as a social movement. So the idea that um, there is a, a radical stance against the norm and there's a chance that this radical stance will become integrated into the system. So we could be thinking of 
you know, vegan entrepreneurs, or we could be thinking the kind of thing that uh, Coralie Wren writes about, you know, the kind of movement issues, movement takeoff, movement moderation, all, all those kind of things. So, so that gives us our first little hint that this concept is, is going to say something that's going to be interesting to, to us, at least I'm hoping you, you're going to agree um, with that. So we can say that instrumental rationality is one, a logic of thought, and two, a way of looking at the world. Now, this is where the first issue where my students would be in tune with, with um, some of the kind of background to all this, because instrumental reason is associated with Louis Lukash, who's a French, um, uh, no, sorry, he's not French, but um, Lukash, who developed Marxism, essentially. He's one, one, one of the people who developed Marxism and brought in a concept and developed a concept called reification. So um, he's known really in the discipline of sociology mainly for a book called History and Class Consciousness from 1923. So this is when Marxism started to, to be developed and when it developed, it became more nuanced. So we, we're going to explore that a little bit. OK, but um, as, essentially the, the bit that we need to take from that is this notion of reification. What Ian Crabe says in the book that I mentioned before, Modern Social Theory, that a good definition of reification is thingification, thingification. So it's pointing out that human qualities can become regarded as things. And this is seen as a negative. Crave further notes that uh, this view sees human relations bearing the appearance of things. And that leads to people coming to see themselves and seeing others as objects. And this is the entire kind of problem from the Frankfurt School point of view. Marcuse writes that society reproduces itself in a growing technical assembly of things and relations, which include the technical utilization of men. Now we're talking about a book written in the 1960s, so we're bound to have this sexist language. We could kind of expect that uh, in some sense. In other words, the struggle for existence and the exploitation of man and nature became ever more scientific and rational. That's our first little hint um, that we'll come on to in a while, that Marcuse took an interest in the environmental movement towards the end of his life. Um, he was writing about them when he died in 1979. And he, he took um, an interest in social movements in general, not least because the agent for Marx of the revolution or social change was the working class. For the neo-Marx, not so much. So we'll, we'll develop those kind of thoughts uh, a little bit, um, little bit later. For Adorno, and talking about capitalism, this is quoted in the, the Bronner book that I mentioned, states that instrumental rationality transforms the actual producers of wealth into objects for the creation of profit. So that really, in terms of what I'm going to say, that's probably the most Marxist thing that's going to be said in, in a way. So it, it kind of it brings up ideas about economic determinism, you know, the base and the superstructure, all, all, the, all those kind of ideas. But that's that's really kind of like the basics of, of, of where the Frankfurt School started, if you like. Going back to Crabe, and importantly this, in terms of this view, it assumes that people come to regard the social world as unchangeable and independent of human action. So again, we can see there that that would be a problem from a vegan point of view. If people see the world as unchangeable or traditional, all those kind of things that, that, that we hear as vegans and independent of human action, that idea about, well, what can I do? It's even an issue within the vegan community. Then, if you like, that's a problem. <coughs> Krabs suggests that that is at the heart of the Frankfurt School conception of instrumental rationality. So we need to clarify some terms here, especially in relation to the word instrumental. Instrumental can be seen in two ways. 
in Frankfurt School thought. So first of all, we've got this idea that it's a way of looking at the world and a way of looking at theoretical knowledge. In other words, instrumental rationality is about seeing the world as an instrument and also using knowledge in instrumental ways. So when seeing the world as an instrument, we might see its elements as tools, as a means of achieving ends, or even seeing the world as a bunch of resources. So again, that would point to why Marcuse took an interest in the environmental movement uh, in the end. An example of that would be, an example of instrumental reason would be taking a tree, but seeing timber, or while viewing a tree, seeing reams of paper rather than the tree's beauty, seeing the pages of a book in the limbs of a tree. That would be an example of instrumental reasoning. Now, Craig um, supplies another example, which is not so much academic, but it's to do with the academy in the sense that he says that he himself might not necessarily see his students as people engaged upon learning. Rather, they become a means for furthering his, in other words, the lecturer's career. So he, as the lecturer, starts to see students instrumentally. There's an interesting flip to that in the modern day, in the sense that modern day students often see uh, a university as a service provider and they see themselves as the client. So in the end, they're all kind of in the modern day seeing each other instrumentally, these, these groups, whereas the kind of more traditional romantic view of a university would be a kind of place of exploration and learning and this, this kind of idea. So Crabe further notes that instrumental reason would suggest that the ability to understand another person is not necessarily subsequently used to aid or assist that person. Rather, instrumental reason encourages such knowledge to be stored up for later use. For a time when understanding a person may be used against them, so to speak, in the sense of persuading them to do something or that we get something out of, out of them, if you like. In fact, I think, um, I'll try and come back to, to Deb's point in, in, a, in a minute, but um, we might think of, you know, if we think about people that we know or we've known, we probably all know of people who seem to think uh, that, uh, knowledge can be used as a weapon and that knowledge can be used to belittle others rather than something to share about in some kind of egalitarian way. So we need to conceptualize this a little bit in the sense that um, maybe if we're thinking, if we're thinking that such examples of instrumentality is what normally goes on in a variety of social settings, that this instrumentality is almost what we naturally do and how we naturally treat each other in the modern world. So if we were to think like that, then perhaps for the Frankfurt School at least, that would be evidence that instrumental reason imbues all of our thoughts and is deeply embedded into the way that we're thinking. However, on the other hand, if we're not thinking that, and we're thinking that people are not really like this, or that it's the system that makes them like this, or at least it's the system that encourages them to be like that, i.e. utilize others for their own ends, then again, from the Frankfurt School, that's making their point all over again. It's almost like the flip side of the same coin that um, whichever way we look at it, it it's making their point. <clears throat> the second use of the term instrumental involves using knowledge also as a means to an end. Uh, Crabe notes that this part of it might be a bit more difficult for us to really get our heads around to some extent. 
And he says, that's because it imbues our culture so much that an alternative might seem inconceivable. After all, what else is knowledge for if it's not to be used as a means to some end? So we tend to develop this point within the Frankfurt School view of things uh, philosophically. And this is where it could get a little bit elitist, perhaps, at least at the start, in the sense that it's suggested that most people probably avoid thinking on a philosophical level. But those who do think philosophically will often see philo philosophizing as a way of working out the meaning of our own life and wider the meaning of life itself. So this is where we can do that kind of sociological trick of moving from the micro to the macro and you know shifting around in, in that spectrum. So for example, we could go back to the individual level and look at it as seeing one's place, my place, one's place in the world. Or we could slide, slide back to the macro level, the general species level, if you like, and then see our place, our species place in the world. So philosophizing in this sense can be seen as a way of living, Craig is suggesting. It might be a way of coming to some settled thoughts about the nature of life and perhaps about the nature of nature too. It holds out the possibility, says Crabe, of a harmonious world of truth with a capital T. And therefore, truth becomes the ultimate value. So this view of the world would correspond with the Frankfurt School view of philosophy. For them, philosophizing is actually a way of living, and it's a lot to do with morality. And in fact, Tom Reagan would chime with this in the sense that he was always inviting people to philosophy, to, to, to thinking, um, and saying, you know, here it is as, as a tool uh, for us, if you like. He would also chime with the founders of the vegan social movement, but we'll develop that a little later. So that's the way the, the Frankfurt School would look at it. Very important for moral growth uh, that we think in those times in those ways. However, if an ordinary, hopeful, modern day person goes to university in the modern, modern day, will they be taught that philosophy is a way of life? Or will they be taught that philosophy is an instrument to utilize? So this, this is the kind of crux of the issue here. Crabe notes the following. He says that the most common view of philosophy is as an underlaborer to science. Science produces knowledge. Philosophy can help the sort of problems that science runs into. Conceptual problems, that means. Difficulties with its theory. Philosophy is a sort of mechanic for the engine of science. So the idea of truth, with a capital T, as a way of living is nowhere to be seen. And that is seen generally speaking, within this view, as a problem. So being concerned with practicalities, instrumental rationality separates fact and value, thus concerned with how to do things and not what should be done. And I, th I think that is the, the place where it starts to really speak uh, to vegans in a sense, because we know, for example, that we as, hu as human beings, we know how to exploit other animals. But the question about what should be done to and with uh, other animals is rarely asked. And I've always said that uh, until recently with cognitive, cognitive ethology, for example, the most we knew about other animals is how to exploit them. And so this is seeing the separation of fact and knowledge and value. And this is why it's very important within the Frankfurt School because Bronner suggests that Marcuse felt that the ethical element of society 
uh, was threatened with eradication, was going to be destroyed. Eradication by an advanced industrial society, which is based on commodification and also the alienating logic of instrumental rationality. So this again is Bronner. He talks about Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin was a essay, um, essayist and critical, uh, a literary critic really, and he's a minor member of the Frankfurt School. So Walter Benjamin argued that alienation, which is a Marxist idea, expresses a poverty of the interior, meaning that alienation generates little interest in reform or revolution. So we can take that to mean that alienation caused by advanced industrial society and the commodification of anything, including people, causes people to look inwards. And perhaps we can think of that knowledge in terms of notions like I'm all right, Jack, or looking after number one, which, which ironically gave, gained uh, more significance when I moved to Ireland, as you can imagine. Again, I think this speaks to the vegan ethos because this alienation from things which creates this poverty of the interior, which then creates little interest in reform or revolution, maybe this is part and parcel of the debates that are going on in the movement. Why are people not so active? Why are they very kind of passive? You know, why aren't we movers and shakers as much as we should and could be and all this kind of stuff. So I think it speaks to some of that. Uh, a critical theorist called Chris Powell, who also was my PhD supervisor, tended to illustrate this point by saying that science promises that it can provide knowledge, say, for example, knowledge that can be used to produce electric kettle prods, but it does not matter to science that this knowledge can be used for torturing people. Therefore, the logic of instrumental rationality suggests that the electric prods can be turned upon human beings if information is required. I challenged Chris on this and, and said, we should also think critically about the very use of electric cattle prods in the first place. And he did take that on board and integrate that into his later um, lectures. But essentially, we've been invited to note the distinction between right and wrong usage here. What's right, what's wrong? Obviously, frequent vegan questions, if you like. Another example would involve the cold science of economics and economic knowledge. Economics to control inflation, for example even at the cost of higher unemployment or poverty and human misery. Because it should be noted straight away that in terms of social policy, those in charge of implementing that kind of policy involving the cold science of economics and the knowledge that it brings and to control inflation at the cost of, of higher unemployment and poverty and misery, those who implement those uh, policies, they're not going to pay the cost. It's the usual kind of thing uh, in that sense, uh, in the sense that, you know, the people um, bringing about these policies don't necessarily pay any price. It's just that that's factored in, but somebody else is going to is going to pay it. Now, Crabe notes that this view of instrumental rationality is wrapped up in the Frankfurt School opposition to so-called value-free science. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this. Uh, we would have done in a normal kind of lecture at university, but not here. But um, we're talking about, this is a relevant part, we are talking about the positive science of society suggested by Auguste Comte, who's an early sociologist. And that's all commonly known as positivism. Positivism. And we do know that uh, Comte held out certain hopes for sociology. Crabe suggests, for example, that he, Comte, thought that a science of society 
would tell us what society really is like and thus would put an end to all the debates about what it should be like. Uh, Comte was writing after the uh, French Revolution when there was a lot of debate about what society should be like. This is precisely the attitude that the Frankfurt School theorists objected to. They said that that view leads to a passive attitude to the social world. If it's not seen as a human product, which is the way they want to see it, but as an external reality uh, governed by laws fixed, like the laws of nature, there's a problem here. And sure, we can deploy knowledge in a technical way. We can alter this and alter that. But the problem is that it's seen that we cannot bring about fundamental change. That by and large, we are the ones who have to adjust to what is, adjust to the things as they are. Now, at this point, I used to show to the students the um, Martin Luther King thing on, on YouTube. It's very short. It's called Maladjusted. So King argued that there are some things in society that he doesn't want to adjust to. And he's got no intention of adjusting to. And that he's quite happy to be maladjusted uh, in some ways. But this entire argument is relevant to veganism in the sense that we can't abandon arguments about what society should be like because we're arguing for a transformation of society. And if the idea is that, well, now everything is fixed and we can find out what, what society is like, but we've moved away from the idea that we can change it, that's very uh, difficult uh, from a vegan point of view. But we see that in our interaction with non-vegans. Oh, well, you know, this, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been, tradition. And we can't change it. And anyway, who am I? I'm just one person. I can't change anything. So we, we see these ideas in our interactions with non-vegans. The Frankfurt School suggests that a social situation in which instrumental reason is seen as the dominant paradigm in terms of modern thinking um, it's strongly influential in both the natural and the social sciences. So we'll briefly look at the origins of instrumental uh, rationality, because this is part of the story in a way. Crabe leads us back to Lukash, saying that when Lukash described the effects of reification on thought, he was evidently getting at much the same thing that instrumental rationality had become dominant but he was based on economics. He did talk about education, but it was, it was a lot of his work was based on economics. And that did invoke the kind of Marxist idea of the economic base and the superstructure and all those kind of things. For the Frankfurt School, however, the roots of instrumental reason go much further back than the development of capitalism. For Max Weber, an early sociologist, the spirit of capitalism was, was caught up in, in a, a religious idea, Calvinism. For Horkheimer and Adorno, they looked at the origins of instrumental reasoning in Judaism. But according to Craig, all of this comes to its own during the Enlightenment, which is seen as the 17th and 18th century intellectual ferment leading to the French Revolution. I used to tell my students to be careful here because there are French, the Scottish, American and, and English revolutions. That was if they were re reading uh, or writing uh, lectures. But there's no, there's no essays required uh, today, so we're, we're OK. Interesting idea, though, isn't it, about this idea of the in intellectual ferment changing the way people think and changing things in a very fundamental way, um, in a sense, because who are we talking about here? Are we talking about the people who toil in the fields? Uh, possibly not. But what we are talking about is a revolution of thought, which gave us the natural sciences. And this revolution involves the almost total instrumentalization of nature. The notion of starting to see nature as machine. And then science sets itself up as some apolitical privileged position from which it can solve problems. 
say, environmental problems caused by human interaction with the natural world. And of course, with climate change and all that, we're seeing all that play out uh, right now. This is something of a move away from seeing nature as God's creation, um, the idea that we're entrusted by the divine uh, in the stewardship model, that kind of idea in which humans have dominion over creation. Um, if you want to chase that idea around, then Jim Mason's book, um, Unnatural Order, is pretty good. Um, he's got a long passage about dominionism, which I used also in my PhD. So that's, that's um, quite interesting. So these thoughts then, the story goes, means a movement away from a situation in which society is seen as a source of support and security. Now we can argue about when that ever was. To one in which the social world is seen as the basis for exploiting others as well as nature in general. So now, this is a bit of a repeat in a way, if people are seen to possess skills which are useful, qualities that are useful, then they are seen in ways that such attributes can be exploited. The real problem from the Frankfurt School point of view is that they see instrumental rationality coming to dominate more and more areas of human activity, becoming like a blanket over everything. In fact, it dawned on the Frankfurt School theorists that Marx himself, some of his thought could be seen as a form of instrumental rationality. And I'm not going to go into this um, in a big way, but we need to touch on it in some degree. So Marx's thought could be seen as a form of um, instrumental rationality, and particularly what was known as strict structuralism. So you've got Louis Althusser, for example, um, which is a kind of structural version of, um, of Marx, which, which is being criticized here, really. Uh, Craig explains that the positivistic attitudes of Marx's work begin to stand out. And this means that in later years, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in particular became increasingly critical of Marx, seeing Marx as accepting the instrumentality of the natural sciences, and especially in his latest work, extending that to society. And so this is an interesting one, in the sense that the regimes of Eastern Europe can be seen as the fruition of instrumental reason as much as the capitalist societies are seen as that. So this is where, again, the neo-Marxist view is much more nuanced from what could be called crude Marxism or even uh, mechanical Marxism. Some people, some people talk about it and that kind of thing. So Althusser's Marxism, this structural version, was seen as a form of instrumental reason. That society is portrayed as the opposite of a human product. That's a, a problem from this view. Rather, it's seen as the producer of human beings. That's a very Marxist way of looking at it. Again, we're back to economic determinism and the, and the economic base and the superstructure idea that we are products of all of that. Whereas what the Frankfurt School and even Althusser to some degree want to talk about is that there's much more of a nuanced relationship between the base and the superstructure. It's not a one-way street. And some of the basic Marxists would say, well, Marx never said that anyway, but it's certainly more of a two-way thing. And again, we as vegans, we're saying that, that we want it to be that if we bring about cultural change, we're going to affect the economics eventually. If only in the first instance, it's going to come through with, say, farming subsidies. So that's the way it, it would work for us in a kind of vegan uh, context. So the problem is that from this analysis, that revolution and socialism seem to have nothing to do with human freedom anymore. Rather, it's just an updating of the machine, the instrumentally rationalized machine. It's just a new model. And so this is why the neo-Marxists were just as uh, condemning of the so-called communist societies as they were of the 
of the capitalist ones. Craig goes on to note about similarities between the Frankfurt School and post-structuralism, but we would have gone into that uh, in a full lecture, but I'm going to skip all of that. You'll be you'll be very pleased to know. This, this is the important takeaway, really, that with critical theory, the Frankfurt School aim is to show that existing society is becoming increasingly irrational. And as it does that, it's also oppressive. That modern day society is oppressive and despite of, or even because of, all the glittering goodies that are available for us to distract us from what we should be doing, that kind of thing. I don't know, I, I always tend to uh, think of professional football in, in, in this light, you know, kind of, you know, kind of bread and circuses, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So they want to show, the Frankfurt School, that the very basic features of humanity are destroyed increasingly by the prevailing system. And the system is governed by instrumental rationality. Now, one critique that could be leveled at the Frankfurt School here is that there's a, an apparent suggestion that there's some golden past that may have existed. And that is a past which is good and should be returned to. And ironically, in this sense, the Frankfurt School often seem to imply that this golden age is in fact what could be regarded as early capitalism, as seen at a time seen as genuine individualism there. And again, we're noting the nuances of analysis here compared with the crude versions of Marxism, if you like. At the same time, and this is where it gets more interesting for vegans, Crabe suggests that part of critical theory is about placing the present in historical context. Showing that because in their view, human society is a human product, it's anything but fixed fixed as in static rather than mended and therefore creating what we want is actually possible and this implies that the golden age might actually be in the future and we need not believe that a golden age previously existed in order for us to work for it it now you know in the here and now and with a hope for the glorious future, if, if you like. Now, I think this is completely in line with what the vegan social movement pioneers uh, were talking about. Uh, because they had this idea of a brilliant future for humanity. But it, it was to do with the moral evolution of humanity. And we're going to just come on to that just in a second. But the idea that we, we you know, Everything is not static. We can work for change because it, it is possible. You know, change is um, possible. Uh, Marcuse also said something which is interesting here in the sense that he said that um, those of us who critique existing society don't necessarily need to have a fully worked out detailed blueprint of the future. Just because we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, we don't have a time machine, doesn't mean that we can't critique what is. This is part of the great refusal, this, this idea that we refuse what is, yeah, with a hope for improvements uh, for what could be, and if you like, what should be. But we don't necessarily have to have this detailed blueprint. But that's exactly what non-vegans demand that vegans produce all the time. It's kind of like, well, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. And also what's gonna to happen to all the cows and what's gonna to happen to this and what's gonna to happen to all of that. And, and they demand for us to give them precise details of what life would be in the future and how they would be getting their income and, and all the rest of it. It's, a, it's really kind of an interesting kind of appeal to stasis almost. I mean, in my TikTok experiment that I'm doing, you've got people, oh, crop deaths and all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, yeah, but we're talking about the future here and, and, and possibilities. And so we're asking you, you know, if, if the 
society becomes more veganic, you know, we'd be saying to you, well, look, here's the funds for R&D. You know, think outside the box. You know, what could stop these crop deaths? Because we don't want them. But what would be the thing that would stop them or, or reduce them, eliminate them? Would it be vertical farming or polytunnels, raised beds, vegan, veganic farming? Y you, you tell us. And we'll work with you in that kind of Reagan way. You know, people of goodwill coming together. But they'll, oh, no, no, it won't work. We can't do that. They're, they're static. We're fluid. We're, we're wanting change. And we're saying, well, look, you know, think about it. You know, how, how do you think it will come about? What what happened, mate? Kind of thing. That, that's that's what, what you get. So th this, is, this is what we get all the time um, from non-vegans. And as Kellner says, going back to the intro of Marcuse's book, <clears throat> uncritical thinking derives its beliefs, norms, and values from existing thought and social practices, while critical thought seeks alternative modes of thought and behavior from which it creates a standpoint of critique. Such a critical standpoint requires developing what Marcuse called negative thinking, Negative thinking, ironically, is a positive thing. So this negative thinking negates existing norms of thought and reality from the perspective of higher possibilities. Now, that to me, what Kellner said and what Marcuse means by negating what is for a future which is based on higher possibilities is exactly what the vegan social movement pioneers said that they said veganism was about the moral evolution of humanity. This place from which we can look at the world and say, this is what we want. You know, how do we, how do we get to it uh, in a sense? So all this for me fits together rather like a jigsaw. Um, Kellner notes, we're getting very close to the end now. Kellner notes that there is a need within critical thought to be able to know the difference between essence and existence, fact and potentiality, and appearance and reality. Critical thought is all about negating mere existence. Indeed, this would be negated in favor of these higher possibilities. Marcuse suggests that new norms, if you like, discovered by reason may be used to criticize and then to overcome lower forms of thought and social organization. So this is what we vegans want. We need to be able to look at the world, criticize what is, and come up with some ideas about what could be. And although lower forms of thought is not necessarily a great way of putting it, that's, that's kind of what we're thinking, that that's, that's a rather negative way of looking at it. We, we've got more um, possibilities, if you like. So the last um, slide of, um, of this would be that Marcuse suggests that the lack of critical thinking creates one dimensionality. I never say that right, dimensionality. And this is, goes back to the pr prospectus. He says, thus, I would propose interpreting one dimensional as conforming to existing thought and behavior and lacking a critical dimension and a dimension of potentialities that transcend the existing society. That to me is what veganism is talking about. That when we talk to non-vegans, they are stuck in this non, in this one dimensional way of thinking. They're coming at us all the time. Well, it's tradition. Well, what can I do about it anyway? Well, it's always been like this. Well, what, what can we do? You know, this is the way it is, right? We're, we are looking for a critique of all that. And we're, we're looking for change. So this is why, from my point of view, this concept is very relevant to the thinking that we engage in and the kind of struggles that we engage in uh, within uh, the vegan movement. So that is just about it. Let me just get rid of this. 
But before we move on to um, any discussion, uh, what's time? Yeah, 50 minutes. Okay. Uh, these here on the screen now, these are um, titles from YouTube um, videos. And um, so they're pretty good. If you, if you want to actually um, pursue any of these ideas, the first one, I've only just come across this one. It's, it's fairly new for me. Herbert Marcuse and the Great Refusal. Uh, that seems pretty good. And, and the concept of the Great Refusal is, is really, really good. The Essential Marcuse by Andrew uh, Feenberg. You probably need to put in University of California TV to get that. But essentially, um, that, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really good kind of overview of, of Marcuse. My favorite is Herbert's Hippopotamus, not least for the reason why it's called that. Then the interview with Brian McGee is really good. And in that, Marcuse talks a lot about the other members of the Frankfurt School, particularly Horkheimer and, and Adorno, probably Adorno the most, I would think. Uh, and then the interview with Helen Hawkins is fairly new to me, but that I've not had time to look at all of it, but it looks pretty good. And um, that's where Marcuse seems to, he does it in other areas, but it seems to hear talk about the agents of change and this move away from the working class has been seen as the revolutionaries to the social movements being seen as the revolutionaries. In fact, in fact, if I do one of these again, I'll probably go to Herbert, um, so to um, Habermas, uh, who's regarded as the second wave of the Frankfurt School. And he develops uh, that idea about who is going to be uh, the agents of, of change, if you like. Then we've got Herbert Marcuse, Angela Davis, another link with veganism and the Frankfurt School. And then finally, we've got um, Feinberg again, uh, Luke Asher's um, theory of reification. It's really interesting. The two Feinberg things are usually kind of um, filmed uh, book launches, and he looks a lot older in the, in the Luke Asher one than he did in the Marcuse one, so that must be much more up to date. And I did notice that there's an, an audio that I, I, I noticed uh, just before we came on, another audio which talks about Marcuse and Angela Davis. Angela Davis uh, was one of Marcuse's um, uh, students. And so, uh, yeah, anyway. So wh what do we do now? Uh, I'll probably get rid of this. Uh, let, me, let me have a look at uh, some of these ideas. I'm gonna have to scroll back um a little bit here lord dowding yeah okay so um okay so lord dowding fund still exists uh, that's interesting uh what else have we got the word man originates from ancient india its definition means thinking mind um we have changed the uh, meaning and language. Um, okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, right. Okay. I was going to try and get back to you. I, I was thinking, Deb, that you were on this one here. I thought you were asking me to do that, but you're thanking me for doing it. So, that, so that's quite good. As I said, I tried to adapt this for, for, um, for the audience. It's, uh, it's recipient design, as, uh, as we say in uh, ethno methodology. Um, where else have we got here? Um, when are you talking about the situationists, as usual? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? If, if, if I look at a tree and see a wood guitar, is that double instrumental reasoning? Mm. There's, all, there's, all, there's always one, one joker in the pack, isn't there? So, um, Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. This is fascinating stuff. I, I hope you found it that. It's it's really, I mean, obviously, we, we trotted through it at quite a pace, to be honest. So, um, you know, so it would it would require kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to set you any homework, but it would require further looking at, I suppose. There you, there you go. Um, okay, what else? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and um, I wonder what that is. Let, let me get rid of this banner as well. Uh, but um, 
Little comments. Mm. Leave the tree alone. That's that's a good one. Um, okay, they've all moved. All the, all. It's actually not a great system, this, because you're just about to click on something, and it moves on, on this system, which is a thing. Leave the tree alone, uh, indeed. Which, ironically, really, isn't it? Because if you look at Movement for Compassionate Living, you know, uh, Kathleen Janaway's idea, um, then that's based on a tree-based society. So that's going to be using a lot of trees. And in that sense, it's really interesting to think about, you know, who is going to be in the trees, uh, who is going to be affected if they're going to be uprooted. Those kind of ideas are, are, are quite interesting. Um, what's this one? This might be getting off topic, but don't most golden age theories often emphasize uh, cyclical ways of life? In nature and by extension human lifestyles um i don't know that actually that's an interesting one um i mean obviously yeah i don't know i mean instead of me just trying to make it up on the spot i'm just gonna say i don't i don't know on that one deb so thanks for that um Yeah, this is one interesting thing about the idea of using knowledge, of course, and science and all that in order, which 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 obviously is is. Um, I think what's really been said is that if we if we lose the moral kind of impetus, uh, then this is kind of not going to happen, and it, it's a bit of a weird one when when you when you think about people doing things which which help the environment, but they're doing things that which help the environment for profit. That's a kind of weird way of looking at it. Um, the the idea that uh, well you've got to with it, we're working within a capitalist society that that is a, a fair and just point. It's just that the, the two things don't seem to marry um, too good um, in that. Uh, a vegan takeaway? <laughs> yeah, food for thought. Well, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Um, right, so. Um, well, look at that. We 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 did that within the hour. So, um, yeah, up yours. Uh, um, what is it? Uh, the Animal Rights Show. We, we managed to do it within the time. So, thanks everybody who tuned in. I I hope you found it interesting. And as Michael says, I hope it's going to be food for thought. But I definitely think that that way of looking at the world definitely uh, chimes in with with what the vegan pioneers saw. This idea of you know uh, higher possibilities and, and all that uh, thank you songstress for that kind comment right so um whilst whilst nobody's asking me questions that i can't answer again um yeah uh, on that one uh, i mean obviously we'll we'll be back to the animal rights show next week but i could i could schedule it for that uh, at least i can i can think of three or four new ones i think um i mean the habermas one would follow on from this that that would be interesting because it talks even more about social movements than than this i suppose this more implies it whereas whereas habermas talks about it in a, in a sense um and then you'd get um then i've got a few lectures on social movement theory which 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 i think are very interesting because I've always thought that um, the, the vegans are going to be really interested in the sociology of movements on the grounds that they're in 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 one or two or several. Uh, it's interesting because um, it turns out that vegans don't seem to be that, that interested. In the same way as many resist the knowing about the history of the movement, um, the actual theories about social movements, which are absolutely fascinating. Um, from an academic point of view, but they're really fascinating if you're in a social movement to, to learn about the ideas around them, you know, about riffraff ideas. And like, for example, just an example of that is the the early, I mean, th th this this is a really mind-blowing example, I think, is the fact that the early theories, sociological theories about social movements is that if you're in one, there's something wrong with you because society is grand and it has these mechanisms, these functional mechanisms, which, you know, if society goes out of kilter a little bit, these mechanisms will bring everything back into equilibrium. 
And so if you're there agitating on the street for change, there's something wrong with you. So these early ones pathologized um, the participants of social movements, kind of atomized them and all that kind of stuff, and call them names, you know, kind of, um, well, I mean, they're often called riffraff theories, this kind of thing. Then in the 1960s, with the rise of civil rights, um, second wave feminism and all that kind of stuff, suddenly sociologists found themselves involved in social movements. And they then found that their theory said to them, well, there's something wrong with you for doing this. And they're going, no, no, I'm, I'm a perfectly rational kind of person. And, you know, there, there is, here are genuine grievances and all this, this kind of stuff. And so they thought, OK, well, look, if I'm in social movements and the theory says that something wrong with me and I don't think there is, then we need to look again at the theory. So this is where the idea of new social movements came in. So that's kind of part of the story, which is really kind of um, kind of interesting in that sense. Um, ooh, I suppose it is, yes. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, in the sense of, uh, I suppose some people would presumably associate instrumental rationality with um, the male mind, you know, very kind of, you know, masculine male way of looking at things, perhaps, in in that sense. Um, and even the critique of it would be seen possibly of, of male mind. Um, and so this idea of, well, we need to inject morality into it, um, then then the eco might talk about, you know, eth ethics of care and that kind of stuff. So I think, I think Nella, that's probably uh, quite, um, uh, quite true. That's probably, probably the case. Obviously, uh, Patrice and Carol are the persons to ask about that, I'm sure. But um, there you go. Ah, right. Um, what's this here from? Who's this guy? Oh, thought, I thought I'd seen the back of you, Rami. There we go. Although the way humans think and behave can, of course, be changed, do you think there are certain basic traits within human beings that need to be taken? Is that into account? Uh, of when trying to create that change. Uh, you mean things like uh, being competitive, um, maybe a bit selfish, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, here is is where, I mean, again, I'd kind of pro probably think about the, the vegan pioneers because they, they, they thought in terms of that if we could bring about a vegan mindset, it would revolutionize the world. And this is interesting, really, because I was watching a Gary Francione uh, thing, as you do, uh, the other day from four years ago, and he was talking about, can you have a sexist and racist vegan? Of course you can. Well, no, not, not according to the pioneers of our movement. Y you shouldn't be able to, because the vegan mindset based on justice and nonviolence and peace should rule that out, should rule those forms of discrimination, those forms of oppression, out as well and that's why the pioneers said that our liberation and their liberation were, were all entangled so i profoundly disagree disagree with francion there but a lot of people say that and of course the animals only people say that of course you know let's bring in the racists and and the sexists so long as they're marching for the animals who cares type of thing they don't quite say that but you know what i mean and so yeah but if that if that's the kind of thing that you mean i i think that a move towards a, um, a better humanity. I mean, this is in danger of sounding a bit pomp pompous, but that, that's exactly what the, the pioneers, especially uh, Leslie Cross, and and then echo back to, to Watson, we're, we're getting at. Watson said that um, veganism was the only movement that can, can save humanity. You know, the, the other movements are lesser movements, which is perhaps an arrogant way of putting it. But certainly... Um, yeah, it, it would it would mean that as we move into this mindset, then it changes our view of the world, which is what which is what the Frankfurt School are saying as well. That if we can think critically, then that negates what is. And again, the great refusal is a great thing. I mean, but what is veganism if it's not the great refusal? We refuse what is, even to the extent that we put ourselves out to do it, right? To the extent that we put ourselves in difficult social situations, we put ourselves in difficult family situations, 
but we still refuse. We, we're not going to go there because of our principles. So yeah, I um. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now this is. Um, I know, Ronnie. This is this is one thing that you've kind of changed a little bit here. This idea of following leaders, and that we need to become the leaders because this this is a kind of innate thing. Um, funny enough, it used to be it used to be when when I, when I was talking. This is first year sociology now. We we used to um, talk about whether a kind of um, society of equals could work in a kind of anarchistic kind of way um could it work and we we said said well let, let's think of it as a supermarket do you think the staff of a supermarket could organize that supermarket in such a way that it would function and they would do things on rotor and all the rest of it and blah, blah blah most of my students said no that there should there needs to be somebody in charge and that uh, people want to to be led and to be told what to do and you, so therefore you need the leaders to, to per perform that kind of functional role and in some ways that's really interesting when we think about all the things that have been said of late and throughout the last few years about say AV for example I was told in Dublin that people love the uniform but they love the idea of they don't have to think much they just get told what to do and they like that okay and that's kind of counter-revolutionary from my point of view and from the critical theorist point of view where the idea would be to engender critical theory uh, thinking which is what universities used to be all about right so hmm ah there's a good slogan we refuse to abuse we refuse to use uh that from deb of course is is very true of course that we are complex um, animals of course um, this also is quite interesting because I think that that is true uh, if 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 human beings are put under pressure we can um, we can you know kind of go to, to these kind of primitive primitive issues like the, the amount of sexual violence that takes takes part place during uh, wars for example when social rules seem to break down i mean there's a lot of worries now isn't there with what's going on in afghanistan with the taliban and all that kind of stuff um so yeah it doesn't take a lot i don't think um but again i'd say that in terms of this, this lecture that it's the it's the viewpoint from these higher possibilities that we're really dealing with i think A lot of vegans are now vegan because their compassion and consciousness has evolved, but many vegans have not evolved their politics in tandem with their veganism. So we have racists, etc. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I suppose um, we could probably say we always have, but um, they've never had such a, a voice in, in a way. They, they've they've got a big platform within the movement, but then you know this this kind of you know alt right um right wing politics seems to have returned in all kinds of of ways to society and that we certainly seem to be in a different um place in the 21st century than where we were in the 1960s i mean in the 1960s um as Marcuse um w was hopeful about the um students were seen as kind of like thought leaders and kind of revolutionaries and all this kind of stuff and the, the idea that we think of students like that now is almost laughable i mean students students are not revolutionary in in, in any sense anymore U usually the only thing that they will uh demo about now is something to do with their fees usually and i know that's been unkind to some students but generally speaking if you like um well i don't know about that you see the point is um there's loads of people who've set themselves up as leaders and prime movers in this movement all the people who are careerists in the national groups all the entrepreneurs they all see themselves as the leaders in in some ways don't they um what we what we need is for people to think outside of that and think more revolutionary see i think 
the idea of leaders and followers is counter-revolutionary. If if you want if you want your vegan outreach to be going on everywhere, then in that sense, everyone needs to think as a prime mover, a, a enabler. Oh, I can do that. I don't have to wait around for it to be done. I can do that. That that seems to be what we need to engender in the movement, rather than thinking we just need people for people to follow. Um, maybe maybe what Ronnie's saying here is is easier than doing the other thing but it's not it's not it's not revolutionary though is it you should always aim for the best and not use our abusive history as an excuse yeah that is true yeah well it, it, yeah, that, that's uh, that's fine, Amber. In the sense that if if you if anybody had to go away, even for five minutes, then then the chances are it went somewhere else by then. So uh, yeah, don't don't worry about that. So, hmm. Mm. Well, yeah, but that's what I just said, didn't I? Um, you know the, the the model that we've got in the in the you know leaders leaders in the movement become become entrepreneurs um or they become employed by the national groups whereas we want people who are prime movers and movers and shakers whatever you want to say to remain at their local level isn't it and so um for everybody, I mean, Francion says this, everybody should think of themselves as a leader. I mean, obviously, sociologists tend not to like the idea of leader, um, but prime mover, certainly. We, we should all set about a system where we can try to encourage um, prime moverism. Is that a word? Um, we, we, we should maybe try and do that, you know. That, that, that would be good uh, if we could do that. Right. Um, I think I'll bring this to an end then, um, uh, if only for the length of the, the subsequent um, uh, recording. So thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Uh, I will consider doing this um, Habermas one at least, and maybe a couple of the social movement theory ones. So um, you never know. So I'm going to say goodbye and thank you very much indeed. <laughs>